Well, welcome. Uh, please take your seats. It's time to begin the day's events. Good morning and welcome to the conference on data privacy in transatlantic perspective, conflict or cooperation. I am Francesca Bignami, professor at the Duke Law School and director of Duke Center for European Studies. We are absolutely delighted to be hosting such an eminent gathering of policymakers, business leaders, and scholars on such an important topic. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to our European visitors who traveled very far to be with us today. We're absolutely delighted to have you here with us. The Center for European Studies and the Law School are committed to exploring the politics, the law, the economics of Europe, and also to understanding the profound differences and similarities that exist between the United States and Europe. This kind of transatlantic comprehension is at the center of our mission as educators and as scholars. It's our ambition that this conference on transatlantic data privacy will deepen our understanding of how American and European society is coping with the transformations caused by the cyber world and international terrorism. What is happening to the right to privacy now that we have the cyber world and social networking sites, now that we have transnational organized crime, e-commerce, international terrorist organizations, and the like? Privacy has long been the subject of transatlantic debates. In 1890, Louis Brandeis and Samuel Warren published their seminal article in the Harvard Law Review entitled The Right to Privacy. Drawing from French and German sources, they made a case for a right to privacy in American law. In the 1970s, European policymakers, some of whom we have here, cited the American scholar Alan Weston in establishing a right to information privacy in Europe. And today, both European and American policymakers are facing the challenges of the cyber world and terrorism. It seems that we are constantly hearing of transatlantic discord caused by their different data privacy policies. This is an ambitious conference. The panels are designed to cover a wide array of topics. Data privacy in consumer transactions, before spy agencies and the police, and in the global marketplace. The panels are designed to encompass a wide range of views, national, foreign, international. And in each case, we have asked the panelists to focus on the cutting edge issues that are at the forefront of privacy debates today. As most of you know, this conference is being held in conjunction with Data Privacy Day. Last year, January 28th was declared Data Privacy Day in Europe. And this year, a number of American institutions, including the state of North Carolina, have also declared January 28th Data Privacy Day. It is my honor and pleasure to read the following message to the conference from the European Commission's Vice President, Franco Frattini. Franco Frattini is in charge of justice, freedom, and security, and data privacy for all of the European Union. Today, the 20th of January, 2008, Europe is celebrating Data Pro Protection Day. As Vice President of the European Commission, responsible for justice, freedom, and security, I welcome today's important event in North Carolina. The procla proclamation of a Data Privacy Day in North Carolina is a significant symbol of the broad universal consensus on the need for privacy protection for everyone. And Vice President Frattini continues by saying, I would like to thank the organizers of this important conference today at Duke University. This offers an excellent occasion to show and understand 
how necessary privacy protection is in a democratic society. The Vice President adds, we all know that the free flow of information is a necessity in our societies in a globalized economy. Equally, police and judicial authorities need to exchange personal information to ensure the security of people throughout the world. But the protection of personal data is a necessary condition for this free flow of information across the globe. That is why we need to work effectively with our international partners, in particular the United States of America and its people. The Vice President adds, we have so much to share together. In November 2006, an informal <coughs> high-level contact group was set up among US and the EU on the occasion of a ministerial meeting in Washington, DC. This group is discussing information sharing and protection of personal data for law enforcement purposes with a view to finding commonalities as part of a wider reflection on how best to prevent and fight terrorism and serious transnational crime. And the Vice President concludes, this is just an example of the way we can join efforts and improve our mutual understanding. Let us work together to kickstart more awareness and provide information for citizens on their privacy rights. Let us work together to guarantee high levels of protection for personal data on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Let me take this opportunity to thank Vice President Frattini for his kind words and to let him know that there is absolutely no doubt that these proceedings will contribute to mutual understanding and will contribute to the improvement of data privacy policy globally. Now, before we turn to the work of the day, it is my honor to introduce Gil Merckx, the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Duke University. He is responsible for internationalizing the activities of Duke University. He oversees Duke University's many foreign languages and area studies programs and has sponsored a number of international initiatives. This conference is but one example of his vision for the university. Gail, I hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the university to give you a sort of an official welcome on, for, from Duke. Um, and uh, since some of you are not from this area, I'd like to take this opportunity to say just a little word about what Duke University is. Uh, we are at present a uh, small, uh, not quite a niche university. We're a bit more than that. We have nine uh, schools and uh, one of which is the undergraduate college, and the other uh, eight are professional schools. We expect soon to have a ninth professional school, which would be in public administration. Uh, we have 12,000, a little over 12,000 students, almost equally divided between graduate and professional students on the one hand, <coughs> and undergraduate students on the other hand. Again, that makes us uh, smaller than most of the universities with which we compete, with the, uh, basically the Ivy League, uh, Stanford, and Chicago. Uh, our professional schools are all small schools. Uh, I think they're smaller than almost all of the competition. That's true for every one of our professional schools. But we strive to make up in quality what we do not have in quantity. And we keep our schools small precisely so they can have a clear profile. And this law school is no exception. It is a, a fine law school with a, a very uh, a strong profile, part of which is, to be, is, is that it is very strong in international law. The story of Duke University is a, you could say, a typical American success story, but it's a movement from the global to the local, just as the issues that you are going to be dealing with have gone from being local issues to being uh, global issues. Duke began in 1838 in a small rural town in North Carolina as a schoolhouse, Brown's Schoolhouse. And over time, that schoolhouse became a normal school, and then it became a, a college, and, and then the college moved in the 18 in the last half of the 19th century to Durham, North Carolina. And then in, in the mid-1920s, uh, James B. Duke and the rest of the Duke family endowed, uh, provided the funding and for building and endowing a, a university which was dropped on top of the college. Just as Harvard University was dropped on top of uh, Harvard College, Yale University was dropped on top of, of uh, Yale College. 
Um, and that, in fact, that whole process whereby our colleges in the U.S., uh, which are like British colleges, became universities like, like the European University, was, in fact, a, an early example of transatlantic borrowing because Americans went to Europe and discovered the European University and then tried to, and then created their own version of the European University uh, by adding the university dimensions to the colleges that existed before that time. Uh, so today, Duke is uh, a, uh, one of the leading private institutions in the United States, although it is the youngest of all of them. It's the only one of the top ten institutions to have to be so young, to uh, the, the last one to crack that sort of charm circle. Um, and one of the hallmarks of Duke's efforts in the last 20 years has been internationalization. Uh, our trustees and our presidents uh, had a vision to make Duke a truly international university, and that effort has proceeded to pace. Today we have more uh, federally funded, and that's sort of the gold standard in international studies, more federally funded international and uh, language and foreign area study centers at Duke than Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, or Chicago. Uh, we, uh, we, teach, uh, we offer 25 different foreign languages. We have a variety of specialized institutes and centers that deal with specific issues of international importance, one of which is the Center for International and Comparative Law here at the law school, uh, led by Rolf Michaels, which is one of the sponsors of today's event. Uh, the Center for European Studies, which Francesca Vignami uh, heads, is, uh, is the other sponsoring organization for this conference here on campus. And that center has, for a number of years now, every year hosted a European uh, a European Union visiting fellow. And this year's visiting fellow is Leonardo Cervera Navas, who is the, the, um, who is the person who had the idea for this conference and who, uh, who led the effort to bring it to fruition. So we're delighted that this collaboration with the EU has resulted in this conference. I'd like to thank Leonardo for his fine work. And with that, I will, uh, I will give the floor back to Francesca. Thank you very much for coming. There's not much more to say except to get down to work. And so now we start our first substantive session. The first panel uh, is going to be on the past and present of data privacy, giving us some of the much needed historical context for our discussions today. And so I just invite the panelists to come up and begin the discussions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Leonardo Cervera. I am the EU Fellow at Duke University. I'm a EU official in Brussels, and this year I have the privilege of being here at Duke University doing uh, research on copyright and data protection areas. I have been asked to moderate this first panel, the past and present of data privacy. And uh, as we have a long day and <coughs> wonderful speakers in the program, I won't refrain from saying anything about this, and I will go directly to introduce the wonderful speakers we have in this panel. I ask um, our speakers to, to stick to 15 minutes, please, so we can have some questions and answers uh, at the end of the panel. Uh, afterwards, we will have a coffee break, something I, I'm sure you're all looking forward to it. The first speaker is uh, Professor Howard Beals. He's associate professor in the School of Business at the George Washington University. Before that, uh, Dr. Beals served as a director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. In that capacity, he was uh, directly involved in a number of privacy initiatives, including the implementation of the National Do Not Call Registry and the development and implementation of the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act of 2003. His aggressive law enforcement program produced the largest redress orders in FTC history. Professor Bills, you have the floor. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the, 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 the history of, uh, of privacy uh, regulation in the United States, and so that's going to be sort of my focus, and then I'll end up by talking some about the approach to privacy regulation that we developed at the FTC uh, and that the FTC is, uh, is still pursuing. <clears throat> Historically, I think um, privacy in the U.S. has mostly been about privacy uh, against the government. Uh, the ability of citizens to pre prevent government intrusions into their homes, into their lives. Um, but, but the focus has been concern about government and the importance of limited government and, and, and limiting what government can do. Uh, that shows up most clearly in our constitutional protections, which are all about well, the, the, the limits on government. Uh, and characteristic of those concerns about constitutional protections is the focus is always about consequences. Uh, how important are the consequences to, uh, to the individuals? If you think about something like stop and frisk cases, for example, in the search and seizure area, the issue is always how intrusive is the search uh, versus how important is it uh, uh, for law enforcement or for, um, uh, or for the safety of police officers uh, in, a, in a particular situation. But, but the focus is consequences. And as the constitutional notions of privacy have expanded to broader spheres, uh, like birth control and abortion, uh, again, the focus has been on things that have significant consequences for individuals, and that's really been the focus of, uh, of U.S. Uh, uh, privacy concerns. Uh, private sector privacy rules have governed, been, been governed primarily by tort law, uh, uh, the right to privacy that, uh, that Brandeis wrote about in, uh, in 1890. Uh, there's torts based on intrusion of, on seclusion, um, uh, where there's torts based on public disclosure of private facts. Uh, there's a tort based on uh, information that puts somebody in a false light. Uh, there's a tort based on appropriation of somebody's image or, uh, or likeness uh, and using that for, uh, for, for commercial purposes. Uh, but characteristic of tort law in general, and certainly the privacy torts, the approach is, on, is, is focused on duties that somebody has with regard to information. Uh, it's not a property rights approach in information. And indeed, U.S. law has never treated personal information as a property right. Uh, rather, the focus has been on what are appropriate uses of that, uh, the, that information uh, and, and how we can, uh, uh, how we can focus uh, um, we can, how, how we can protect consumers uh, uh, from adverse consequences of information use. Um, what really started to change uh, uh, privacy approaches in the United States uh, uh, was the emergence of significant technological changes. Uh, it really started in the late 1960s uh, with the growth of computerization. Uh, and, and the notion of all the information that you could store on punched cards and magnetic tape um, uh, in, in a technology that today uh, is, is uh, I mean, I see a dozen computers here that are more powerful than anything that existed probably in the, 19, uh, in the 1960s or, uh, or 1970s. Uh, but the reduced cost of access to information through, uh, through computerization and the ease of storage uh, made possible a lot of benefits uh, from information sharing and information use, but it also renewed concerns or provoked concerns uh, about privacy interests in that information. Um, what that led to was a statutory response that, again, you know, consistent with the American notion that what matters here is consequences, uh, was focused on information in particular sectors that raised really significant consequences for consumers or potential consequences. It was probably the first uh, federal uh, uh, significant privacy uh, uh, statute was the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, which was enacted in 1970. Um, uh, again, this is very sensitive information uh, about payment histories and, uh, uh, and, and the like for, uh, for individual consumers, but it's very important information to the efficient operation of credit markets. Uh, if, if, if you can't assess the risk that a particular uh, uh, borrower poses, uh, then credit markets aren't going to focus as a, uh, function as efficiently. Credit's going to be less available to, uh, to people who, uh, who would like to, uh, to get it. It's also interesting because it's information that some consumers would surely like to block. Uh, if you let people have a choice about whether or not their payment history is going to be reported, it's pretty predictable who's going to choose not to have their payment history reported, and it's the people who don't pay their bills. Uh, again, uh, the ability to block the sharing of that information would substantially reduce and perhaps destroy uh, the value of a very important uh, economic uh, system. 
The approach that the Fair Credit Reporting Act takes is to limit the uses of information to certain permissible purposes. Uh, you can use the information for uh, decisions about employment, about credit, uh, uh, about insurance. Again, issues with significant consequences uh, to, uh, to individuals. Um, uh, but that's the focus. It's not the information collection or sharing or the information itself. It's the permissible uses of the information uh, uh, that the statute regulates. Um, a second development was in 1973 when the, the, uh, the old Department of Health, and Human, or Health Education and Welfare uh, uh, looked at computerization uh, and its implications uh, uh, for privacy. Uh, it developed a set of guidelines, that's uh, what we know today as the fair information practices uh, 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 about uh, to assess uh, uh, privacy issues. The focus of its concern, though, was really data matching, uh, and mostly data matching uh, uh, by the government, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about fair information practices in a minute. Uh, but, but that's uh, important to bear in mind that that was the focus, uh, it was again information privacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government. Um, the HEW guidelines led fairly directly to the 1974 Privacy Act, uh, which is again about the relationship of government to, uh, to citizens. Uh, uh, it, is, it governs government systems of records uh, that are organized by personal identifiers, uh, whether it's name or, uh, or social security number. Uh, and the Privacy Act is something that's very much based on the fair information practices that came out of the, uh, the HEW guidelines. Um, there's one important caveat about that, though, and that is the nature of notice. Because what the concern that provoked the Privacy Act uh, was in part a concern about the government might be maintaining secret databases that nobody knew about. Uh, and the notice structure that the Privacy Act creates is not a notice to individuals. It's not a notice to the people who are providing the information. It's a notice to the public in the Federal Register uh, about, the, uh, uh, about the system of records that is, uh, that is being uh, maintained. Works great uh, for making sure that there aren't secret databases because the government has to tell you about it, but it doesn't do much uh, about telling individuals uh, about the information that, uh, uh, that they may be uh, 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 they may be, the, the government may be storing. Well, you know, after 1974, there was a lull of, of, of 20, almost 25 years uh, before there was significant additional federal privacy legislation. Uh, and change was again provoked by a new set of technological developments, uh, this time uh, the emergence of the Internet. Uh, the Internet uh, raised new concerns uh, uh, because uh, more information could be collected in sort of the, the continual cascade of improving uh, uh, technology. Um, it also raised new concerns because it seemed like a very private and anonymous activity. Here you are in your study or your living room or wherever, um, surfing, surfing uh, the then nascent web. Um, uh, where there was almost nowhere to go, but, <laughs> but there were some places. Um, uh, and um, it seemed very private, but it wasn't. I mean, there was a lot of information out there that, was, uh, uh, that could be tracked and maintained. Um, uh, it didn't necessarily have your name on it, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but there was a lot more information uh, out there. Uh, and that was a set, in part a set of new concerns, and in part it provoked a new attention to uh, old issues, because a lot of the information sharing and the information collection that was happening on the internet and became visible on the internet had long gone on in the real world, in the offline world, uh, uh, where information gets exchanged uh, in all sorts of formats uh, by, uh, by all sorts of, uh, of businesses. Um, in any event, uh, the, the growth of the Internet did provoke a new wave of concerns. Uh, in 1995, the Federal Trade Commission began its first in a series of workshops uh, on privacy issues uh, on the Internet. Uh, what those workshops did was to encourage companies to adopt privacy policies uh, for, their, uh, for their websites. Uh, and once a company has adopted a privacy policy, uh, it's something that becomes enforceable by the Federal Trade Commission under, uh, under the FTC Act, because if you violate what you said in that privacy uh, policy, uh, well, that's a deceptive practice. Uh, and that's something that the FTC uh, can and, and has uh, acted against. Um, Consistent with the notion that consequences matter, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the federal regulatory uh, uh, statutes expanded to cover another of another, uh, several other particularly sensitive areas uh, where, where information might be at issue. 
Uh, sort of the, 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 the next major enactment uh, was in 1996, uh, and that was the HIPAA legislation, the Health Insurance Payment and Portability Act. Um, and what that act was really about was medical information exchange for, uh, for billing. Uh, this was a, 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 a money-saving law. Uh, to reduce the costs of, uh, of medical billing. But if we were going to standardize and computerize all this information, Congress recognized that there might need, uh, be a need for, uh, for privacy protection for that information. Uh, so it gave itself a deadline of 1999, and it said if Congress didn't act by 1999, um, then the government should go ahead and write rules about the privacy of health information. Well, Congress didn't act. The government did go ahead and write rules, but not until 2000, and they didn't really uh, become enforceable until 2003. Uh, the next development was, again, focused on particularly sensitive information, and that was in 1998, uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, which governed information collected knowingly from kids under 13. Um, it was internet-based. It's the only statute that's really internet-based uh, at, uh, at the federal level. Uh, but it only covers about 150 to 200 websites, somewhere in that range. There's very few websites that, that deliberately collect uh, personal information from children. Uh, and then in 1999, uh, uh, Congress uh, acted to uh, enact the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which governs the privacy of financial information. Uh, again, this was provoked by a statute that was to remove the barriers uh, uh, to financial institutions competing on each other's turf. Uh, the barriers that had been uh, uh, created in the 1930s and were pretty clearly obsolete. But again, it also provoked attention to the privacy issues uh, and, the, and the need for what became very much a fair information practices-based approach uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to privacy issues. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the Federal Trade Commission's role in, in, in privacy, because I think it's important in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the general American scheme of things, of taking um, a, a general purpose statute and adapting it to, uh, to uh, address a new and emerging set of concerns, because that's very much what's happened with the FTC Act. Um, the Act prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Uh, the Commission's early cases uh, involving uh, uh, privacy issues all involved uh, uh, deceptive, deceptive practices. Uh, somebody made a promise in a privacy policy uh, and uh, then violated that promise uh, uh, based on what their actual conduct was. Uh, the first case was in 1998 uh, 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 against, uh, against uh, uh, GeoCities. Um, uh, and there's been a number of, uh, a number of cases uh, uh, since then. Uh, and that FTC role has really become the basis of the Safe Harbor Agreement with the EU um, because the way Safe Harbor works is companies make a promise in privacy policies. The enforcement of that, uh, those promises is up to the FTC uh, because it's a privacy policy like any other privacy policy and that gives rise to the possibility for, uh, uh, for, for FTC enforcement. Um, when I got to the Commission in 2001, uh, privacy was really a new issue. It, it, it had, was not something that I had been involved in before or that the Commission had been involved in in my, uh, uh, in my, my prior uh, uh, tenure at the Commission. Uh, and we started thinking about what was the appropriate role for the Federal Trade Commission in policy in, in privacy issues and, and, and how we should approach it. Uh, and our starting point was thinking about fair information practices uh, and, uh, and, and, and notice and choice. Uh, in particular. Now, you know, notice and choice is a very attractive concept on its face. Uh, it, uh, and, and, and there is, and particularly if you think about the context of the HEW guidelines originally, uh, it certainly must be the case that if I know what you're going to do with my information and I agree to let you deal with my information, to use, do that with my information, there can't be a privacy policy or a privacy problem. Right? Because I, I, I shared this information deliberately, knowingly, I chose to let you do that. Um, the converse doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that if I didn't know or didn't have a choice that there is a privacy problem. Uh, there might be, there might not be, but, but, but it's, it's, it's really a separate issue as to whether there actually is a privacy, uh, privacy problem. Uh, as we thought about fair information practices, uh, uh, we, th we, we thought about difficulties with both notice and choice. I'm going to start with choice because I mentioned it before. There's important places where choice just won't work uh, for the value of information sharing. I mentioned credit reporting. 
Uh, if, you, if you let people have a choice about whether information gets reported to credit reporting agencies, the system can't work. Uh, another example is property recording. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a mortgage on a piece of property, it's got to be recorded and, and uh, uh, available for public consumption. If you let consumers have a choice about whether or not their mortgage is going to be reported, well, I can pledge my house to five or six different creditors uh, and take out five or six different mortgages. All right? the, the, ability to, the, the inability to choose whether that information is available or not is crucial to the way the system functions. Uh, uh, so choice is difficult in some contexts. Um, notice is also problematic, and I think the, the biggest difficulty with notice uh, is the sheer costs of using the notice. Uh, when I talk to my students about privacy, I always ask how many of them have noticed that they got financial privacy notices under the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. Uh, about half will claim that they recognize having received a privacy notice. Um, I ask how many of them have read the privacy notice. Uh, maybe 2% will claim to have read the privacy notice. Uh, I ask any, how many of them have done anything based on that privacy notice, and the answer is almost, no, always, almost always nobody. Um, the, the, the premise of notice and choice is consumers are reading notices, making decisions based on notices. The reality is consumers have better things to do with their time than read privacy notices. Uh, same thing happens on, on uh, privacy policies on web pages. Uh, Click-through rates to the privacy policies themselves are abysmal. Uh, the information's there. Consumers aren't making much use of it. Um, uh, it's not important enough for most consumers most of the time uh, to spend their time and effort to, uh, to process uh, uh, the notice. So we didn't like the idea of uh, privacy based on notice and choice. Uh, and what we came up with instead was an approach to privacy based on consequences. Um, uh, that, that, that information use can have bad consequences for consumers. We ought to protect consumers from those bad consequences where we can. Uh, but the focus ought to be on the consequence and not on the information. We ought to be protecting the consumers and not the data, uh, uh, if, if you want to, uh, to think about it uh, uh, that way. Um, that led to two major innovations in the FTC's approach to privacy. Uh, and one of them was the do not call registry. Uh, it's very hard to get there from a notice and choice a perspective to privacy. Um, if you think about the notice and choice approach to, uh, to do not call, in a sense, it's keep your telephone number secret. Uh, and if nobody knows your telephone number and you didn't give anybody permission to use your telephone number for telemarketing calls, well then, you won't get any telemarketing calls unless you slip up and give somebody permission once, and then they can share the information. Or unless you want to be publicly listed in the phone book because, the, because you want your friends to be able to find you. Or unless the telemarketing is done by random digit dialing where they don't even need, your, need to know your telephone number. Uh, okay, Notice and choice can't address those issues all right, as an approach to privacy. All right, instead, what do not call does is essentially to create a different kind of a property right, not in the information, but in the seclusion of your own home. Uh, it's an electronic no trespassing sign and one that's enforceable by the federal government. Uh, but it's your choice to, to, uh, to put up the no trespassing uh, uh, sign, uh, and, then, and then the government can, uh, can help to enforce it. Right? But it's a consequences-based approach. If this is a consequence consumers want to avoid, let's give them a cheap and easy way to avoid it that doesn't require them wading through a pile of privacy notices to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, the second set of innovations had to do with information security cases. There's a lot of places where businesses have uh, uh, information that is very sensitive. When we were thinking about this issue and asked the staff, where are there breaches of privacy, it turned out the breaches that, that, uh, uh, that were surfacing and that the staff knew about were, were not information sharing in the sense of, yes, I want to give this information to somebody. They were information theft. Uh, either, either bad guys breaking in and taking sensitive information and using it for bad purposes, or just sort of sloppiness in the process that led to the collapse of, uh, uh, of security and the leakage of information uh, that could have bad consequences uh, to consumers. So we started bring, bringing cases based on uh, 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 inadequate security practices to protect information uh, that companies held. Um, uh, the first cases uh, uh, were, uh, were based on deception. Uh, companies made uh, uh, promises in their privacy policies or elsewhere that said they'd take care of sensitive information. 
Uh, we said, well, if you didn't take reasonable and appropriate security measures, given the sensitivity of the information, to protect that information, well, that's a deceptive practice in violation of the FTC Act. Um, uh, we brought cases against Eli Lilly, against Microsoft for the passport system, um, uh, several cases uh, uh, against, uh, against retailers and against websites uh, uh, based on uh, failure to take reasonable and appropriate uh, security measures. Uh, what we looked very hard for, and I, you know, for better or for worse, we couldn't find, but it turned up as, as I was on my way out the door, uh, was a case based on unfairness. No privacy promise at all. Uh, but a company that, uh, uh, that failed to take reasonable and appropriate security uh, precautions with information that it had. Uh, the first unfairness case was against uh, uh, BJ's Warehouse. Uh, the problem at BJ's, which is a retail warehouse club kind of, uh, kind of operation, I'm not sure if it's in this part of the country or not, um, uh, was uh, they used, uh, uh, they used uh, wireless uh, uh, networks in the store. Um, unencrypted wireless networks in the store. Uh, you could sit in the conveniently, private, conveniently provided coffee shop with your uh, uh, laptop computer and watch the credit card numbers fly by. Um, uh, various information thieves did that, stole a wide variety of credit card numbers. Uh, uh, credit card fraud uh, increased as a, as a result of uh, uh, those, those compromises of information. And what the commission said was that's an unfair practice. All right, that's something that's causing substantial injury to consumers. They can't avoid it. There aren't offsetting benefits uh, to not taking reasonable and appropriate security measures. There is no promise to consumers. All right, BJ's never made such a promise. All right, but the action by the Federal Trade Commission to protect the information is nonetheless possible uh, under the unfairness jurisdiction. All right, and there are several subsequent unfairness cases, partly on that uh, uh, fact pattern, partly on, a, uh, on, on uh, uh, data broker cases uh, uh, where, uh, uh, where the security of information that's, uh, uh, that's being, like choice point, where the security of information that's being sold about consumers has been compromised. Uh, okay, but it's a consequences-based approach to, uh, to privacy, to protect people from bad things happening as a result of the use of their information, whether it's annoyance in the case of do not call or identity theft or fraud uh, uh, in, the, in the case of the information security uh, cases. Follows naturally from thinking about consequences, right, doesn't follow very naturally or in any direct way uh, from, uh, uh, from thinking about fair information or notice and choice. Uh, so that's the brief historical overview and uh, sort of where, where privacy stands uh, um, when I left the Federal Trade Commission and mostly still where it stands today at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, as a European, I have learned a lot with your, with your explanations. Uh, let me go to our second speaker. Uh, professor Rodota is a uh, professor of law at uh, Università di Roma La Sapienza uh, at the Institute for Human Science in Florence, Italy. He has been a member of the Italian Parliament for many years, member of the European Parliament, and also member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. More recently, Professor Rodota has also been a member of the Convention for the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. I must say that Professor Rodota is uh, living history in the world of data privacy because he has been involved in the policy making of data protection since the very beginning, since the early 70s. He was one of the drafters of the OECD guidelines and afterwards he was the first uh, president of the Italian Data Protection Authority and the second president of the so-called Article 29 Working Party, that is the group of European data protection authorities that meet regularly in Brussels. I had the honor and privilege uh, to work with Professor Dota in Brussels, and uh, I'm personally very grateful that he has come to Duke University to share with us uh, his thoughts about the past, uh, the present, and um, perhaps the future of data protection in Europe and in the United States. Professor Rodota, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, Leonardo, and thank you for this kind invitation to Duke's School of Law. Why is the same day called Privacy Day in the US and Data Protection Day inside Europe? 
It's not semantics. This wording reflects different sociopolitical approaches. It is the result of a long and complex European history whose provisional final point can be found in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, with its clear-cut distinction between privacy protection, Article 7, and personal data protection, Article 8. Let me start looking at the context. In February 2003, when the US administration and the European Commission were negotiating the transfer of airline passengers' personal data, the American Civil Liberties Union presented a document whose final words were the following. When it comes to privacy protection, we want to join Europe, not to have them to join us. Last December, in an article published by International Herald Tribune, was emphasized that, I quote, American privacy groups are pressuring the European working group because they believe they stand a better chance of shaping more aggressive regulation in Europe that ultimately could have a global effect. I would like to go beyond the, the, the privacy protection. Is it true that Europe's vision of the future is quietly eclipsing the American dream, as Jeremy Rifkin wrote in his book, The European Dream? Rifkin expressly mentions the charter and the protection of personal data, and he goes so far as to say that the European government, I quote, has become unquestionably the leading government in the world as to fostering human rights. Commenting the death penalty moratorium by the UN in an essay published last December in the review Survival, J.R. Schmidt said, the architects of the EU influenced by US presidents and anxious to define what EU was for, fastened on that penalty as a way to say it's the moral high ground. The same stance was highlighted in connection with the Bali Conference on Environment and the role played by EU. All these quotations taken only from American sources are not meant to dispel the impression of a sort of European pride. They are aimed at highlighting the context where transatlantic perspective must be evaluated, taking seriously the general perception of fundamental rights and the shared awareness from which cooperation can grow as to reduce the scope for conflicts. So looking at the European data protection in historical perspective, we can find four turning points. S uh, 1970, end of 70s and beginnings of, eight, of 80s, 1995 and 2000. As Professor Bignami has already pointed out, 1970, in 1970, there were significant coincidences in the US. Alan Westin published Privacy, Privacy and Freedom, which marked the turning point in the analysis of these issues. In the same year, Two German lenders, Esse and Bayern, passed two acts, acts addressing specifically data protection. In Italy, within an, an act uh, on the protection of employees' rights, a section prohibited employers from collecting information on employees' political, trade union, and religious opinion. This is the first rule giving a, sh a strong specific 
protection to the sensitive data. In a transatlantic perspective, this shared cultural pace is remarkable, at least until 1974, when the US Privacy Act was passed. After this date, in my opinion, European and American ways started diverging, even if many cultural similar similarities continued to exist. Two brief comments on these pieces of legislation. The Italian Act highlighted what could be regarded as a privacy paradox. In fact, the ban imposed on, employee, on employers against the collection of employees' sensitive data was not grounded on privacy concerns. It was actually intended to ensure the possibility for employees to express their opinions publicly without running the risk of being discriminated against. The focus was on equality, not secrecy or privacy. On the other hand, the first German acts started up a phase that paved the way to recognition of informational self-determination as a fundamental right by the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Constitutional Court, in 83 going beyond the mere protection of one's private sphere as it is aimed at safeguarding the new citizenship in the age of science and technology. The legislative framework of Europe was expanded with the law passed between the late 70s and the early 80s in Germany, Austria, Denmark, France, Norway, Spain, Luxembourg, the United Kingdom. And there is another coincidence, because such a deep modification of the regulatory scenario in Europe took place in a context featuring the same principles projected on the, onto an international stage with the OECD guidelines in 1980 and the Convention 108 of the Council of Europe, 81. In the early 80s, the European model had taken shape with the first generation laws, omnibus laws, and followed by the sector-specific legislation and second generation law implementing the European Directive 9546. The source components of the European model can be tracked easily. Europe took up the concept of privacy developed firstly in the United States and also imported from the US the idea of an independent supervisory authority, which became a key component of the European model. But the combination of these components have yielded a cocktail that is not very palatable to Americans. They find it as paternalistic authoritarian flavor and would prefer a mix of sector-specific legislation and self-determination. This gap and the resulting disagreement have not disrupted the cultural dialogue, nor the possibility to get back to shared reference point, as shown by many similar definition of data protection proposed on both sides of Atlantic during past years. Another turning point came in 1995 with the European Directive. At the time, it was affirmed that the approximation of laws, I quote, must not result in any lessening of the protection they afford, but must, on the contrary, seek to ensure a high level of protection, end of the quotation. This statement can be accounted for by circumstance that the directive was not the outcome of cultural and political momentum. It was based mostly on economic consideration. 
the freedom movement of people and capitals and the freedom of establishment set out in European treaties had to be completed by the free movement of personal data. Thus, there was the risk that data protection would be a weak component because it would only be conditional upon market requirements. This risk could be averted almost in full and data protection became a key piece of the European puzzle. Uh, also because the setting up of new institutional bodies like the Article 29 Working Group and later the European Supervisor. Fourth turning point in 2000, when Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU recognized data protection as an autonomous right. The evolution is clearly visible comparing the Charter with the provision of the 1950 Convention on Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Under Article 8 of this convention, everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life. Conversely, the Charter draws a distinction between the conventional right to respect for his or her private and family life, Article 7, and the right to the protection of personal data, which becomes a new autonomous fundamental right. Moreover, Article 8 expressly envisages access rights and provides that compliance with these rules shall be subject to control by an independent authority. This distinction is more than an empty box. The right to respect for one's private life mirrors an individualistic component. This power basically consists in preventing others from interfering with one's private life. In other words, it's a static ne negative kind of protection. Conversely, data protection sets out rules on how to collect and process data and empowers people to control that. It's a dynamic kind of protection. Additionally, oversight and other powers are not only conferred on the persons concerned, the data subjects, as they are also committed to an independent authority. So it is a redistribution of social and legal powers that is taking shape. Furthermore, Article 8 should be put in the broader context of the Charter, which refers to new rights arising out of scientific and technological innovation. Article 3 of the Charter Deals, deals with the right to the integrity of the person, the protection of physical body. Article 8 deals with personal data, the protection of the electronic body. These provisions are directly related to human dignity, which Article 1 of the Charter declares to be inviolable. Thus, data protection contributes to the constitutionalization of the person because it has turned into an essential tool to freely develop one's personality. And there is a true reinvention of data protection. Data protection can be seen to sum up a bundle of rights that make up citizenship in the new millennium. The institution, so the institutional framework would appear to be reassuring. In fact, reality is becoming increasingly in estranged from it for three basic reasons. Firstly, after 9-11, many reference criteria changed and guarantees were reduced in Europe too. Secondly, this trend towards downsizing safeguards was extended sector 
that are trying to benefit for the change in the general scenario, such as those related to business. Thirdly, the new technological opportunities make continuously available new tools for classification, selection, social sorting, and control of individuals, which are resulting in a very technological drift that national and international authorities are not always capable to adequately counter. In this manner, some of the principles, principles underlying the system of data protection are being slowly eroded. First, the purpose principles, principle, the multifunctionality criterion is increasingly applied. Data collector for a given purpose are made available for different purposes. Data processed by a given entity are made available to different entities. Reuse and interconnection are becoming leading criteria. Following this approach means not only to go against essential principles of data protection. Indeed, it means to break up a covenant with citizens in a sector that became essential to ensure their freedom and the same democracy. Citizens had been promised that their data would be processed by public bodies for purposes specifically set out in the law, and the private bodies would only be enabled to do so on the basis of the data subject's consent. The fundamental right to data protection is continuously eroded by alleging the prevailing interests of security and market logic. To counter this regressive reinvention of data protection, we need political legal strategies not to not only defend what has been formally recognized, but to also develop its inherent poten potential reinforced by the European Charter. Reflecting on my own experience, I do believe that that protection is still a necessary utopia, an inelegant a democratic utopia. For that, it's important that last week, European Parliament decided to support a new utopia, an internal bill of rights and that Council of Europe is now discussing on a new protocol on data protection. In the absence of strong safeguards for the information concerning people, concerning them, people are increasingly in danger of being discriminated against because their opinion, uh, religious belief, equal, uh, health. Data protection is therefore to be regarded as a key component of the equality society. In the absence of strong safeguards for the data concerning <coughs> political opinion, opinions or membership of parties, trade unions, associations, citizens run the risk of being excluded from the democratic process. Thus, data protection is becoming a prerequisite for being included in the participation society. In the absence of strong safeguards for the electronic body, personal freedom as such is in danger. Therefore, there is a little doubt that data protection is a necessary tool to defend the society of freedom and counteract the drive towards establishment of a society of surveillance, classification, social selection. From this point of view, data protection could be defined as the most fundamental of the fundamental rights. We need, again, a visionary culture for dealing with our own future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rodota. I never stop learning from from you uh, after all these years. And then our last speaker uh, 
is uh, Peter Hustings, that um, is normally referred in the American press as the European Data Protection Czar. He is uh, considered to be one of the most influential persons in the world of uh, data protection. Uh, this is so because, uh, as Professor Rodota, he has been involved in the policy making of data privacy since the very beginning, and still he is involved in the policy making. Before becoming the first uh, European Data Protection Supervisor in 2004, he was the first president of the Article 29 Working Party and also the president of the Dutch Data Protection Authority for many years. I also had the, the privilege to work with him in Brussels, and I personally believe that his presence today in this uh, conference is a clear signal that despite any differences uh, or disagreements between Europe and the United States, uh, the European Union is deeply committed to a transatlantic understanding in the field of uh, data protection. Peter Hustings, you have the floor. Uh, Leo, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let me start by congratulating uh, Duke Law School, uh, Francesco Bignami and, and yourself, on taking this, uh, this initiative um, of organizing Data Protection Day on the 28th of January and organizing this conference on such an interesting uh, transatlantic topic. Um, it's remarkable because 28 January two th um, was the date in 1981 on which the Council of Europe Convention on Data Protection was signed. That was not a European convention, but it was designed to be an international convention, an open convention, which unfortunately so far has not attracted any signature from a non-European state. Um, the Council of Europe then last year uh, suggested that this date should be celebrated to, to, to emphasize the importance of data protection in today's world. And so I'm delighted to see that this initiative is attracting uh, this support already in its, in its second, uh, second edition. And you join in with many European countries doing the same. Um, my, my comments today I would like to focus on, on basically three points. Um, that is, some reflections on the concept of, of privacy and data protection, tracing some of the thoughts uh, Professor Rodota has already presented, um, and highlighting some, some elements. Then, uh, a few comments on, on the basic principles and perhaps some of the commonalities and differences and how we deal with this, and then, finally, on, on the challenges and how we could face the challenges. On the concept of privacy and prote data protection, let me mention, first of all, that in the 1960s and 70s, in both our societies, there was a sensitiveness, sensitivity for this issue. Uh, popular and less popular literature was published dealing with technology, intrusion, and things like that, uh, with a wiretapping, uh, subliminal communication, and all kinds of things. Um, Vance Beckard, but a very influential book indeed already mentioned, Alan Weston, Privacy and Freedom. And then in, this, in the subsequent years, a number of incidents, a number of incidents, high published incidents, led to legislation and protection. And in the US, this was definitely the Watergate case, I think, very visible. If you, if you read the hearings, um, the role of Senator Sam Irvin in this, it was very clear uh, what the concerns were. And I think uh, Howard Beals has already mentioned the focus. Um, but similar incidents happened in Europe in various member states. And they were sometimes very symbolic, dealing with censuses, uh, dealing with introduction of personal numbers, population registers, and a new shape, etc. There was also the era, and this was already mentioned, of the HEW principles, uh, health, education, welfare. If you read that text, I think it is still very clear that um, it, it, is, uh, it is very close to what ended up in the 
Council of Europe and OECD text on, on data protection. So that was, that was clear common ground. And I must say, as a personal note, it was also the era in which I was studying at the University of Michigan Law School and, and was, was taking on board some of this thinking, uh, which then held me forward in, in Europe. But from a European perspective, it is evident that this was dealt with very much in the light of human rights perspective, general. The Council of Europe um, is the organization which was established right after the Second World War. And its first and most important accomplishment, and still, was the European Convention on Human Rights. And this Article 8, referred to already, provides a general right to the protection of private and family life. And then it proceeds to say that any interference with this right should be uh, allowed only on the basis of, say, legal authority and, where necessary, in a democratic society to protect legitimate interests. This article, together with a number of other articles, uh, was part of a reflection in the early 70s on the international level to see whether these safeguards were still up to date in the face of uh, developing societies, technologically and, and otherwise. And Article 8 on privacy sort of was highlighted as, as an, in, an, an important provision which needed to be looked at in more detail. And I want to mention that three deficiencies were found in that approach. First, the concept of privacy was unsure. That reflects also, say, the, the case law in the United States about reasonable expectations of privacy. But the European thought about this. It's, it's unclear, it's difficult to, to really draw the line. Second, this provision was directed only against public authorities interfering. And, um, and it was felt that um, in, in the developing society, as we know it now, it was not the only relevant power against uh, which citizens and consumers needed protection. And thirdly, it was a rather negative protection. No interference unless it was felt that a more structural approach was necessary. And that structural approach, a wider approach, a more positive, was then developed in the principles of data protection in the Council of Europe Convention, which was uh, eventually uh, adopted in, in 1981 on the 28th of January. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that although there is a clear relationship with the right to privacy, there are also quite interesting differences. This more structural, more inclusive approach, but also references to other fundamental rights. For instance, the inhibiting effect of continuing surveillance on the right to, to free expression and the right to free assembly, the connections with non-discrimination, and fair process in general. So these, these inspiration points were taken on board in the principles on data protection, and these connections are still quite visible. Then various member states started to legislate on the national level on the basis of these principles, and this led to considerable diversity. The European Union European Community uh, and the Commission as its administrative center decided to take action to reduce this diversity. So this was not a human rights instrument per se, it was an instrument to, to bring harmony in diversity. And that led to the directive in 9546. But now it's interesting that five years after that, and this was mentioned by Professor Rodota, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is a new restatement of fundamental uh, uh, safeguards in the European Union, then recognized the right to privacy and the right to data protection next to each other as separate fundamental rights. And in case law of the European Court of, of Justice, uh, we have seen some clear examples about how these two interact. Now, we'll come back to this in a minute. So. Um, uh, the Europeans see 
uh, privacy and data protection as closely related but also separate fundamental rights interacting and they have inspired a lot of, of uh, uh, action on different levels. Now, if we focus on the basic principles which are part and parcel of, this, um, of, of these uh, frameworks, then there are some striking elements I want to highlight here this morning. First, they have a general scope. They apply to public and private and all different problem areas alike. They have a general scope. And they deal with all relevant faces of the information society. They do not only deal with collection of data. It's not only the question, could data be collected? It's about storing, exchanging, keeping, retention, obviously. And it's about deletion, even. All relevant phases are part of these principles. And the principles set, in other words, conditions under which these data processing phases could take place. They state, as a consequence, duties for responsible organizations, be they private or public. And they create rights and reasonable obligations in these contexts for those who are affected and make them party to what is happening. So they set procedures. It's a system of checks and balances to make sure that the values uh, are protected or the benefits of these rules are, are delivered. And that is a totally different perspective from the, say, notice and choice thinking, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the focal point in, in US analysis. Now, another interesting point and that is also a very important pack a part of the, of the package, is the principle of independent supervision. Typically, uh, a data protection authority. And that reflects, I should say, also the, the way Europeans look at government uh, as a source of protection of fundamental rights. That is not necessarily seen as the threat so data protection authorities, independent from government, but nevertheless, of course, public authorities, have been playing an important role to enforce these rules, also to develop them, to give guidance on how they should apply. And they have taken a role in, in consultation on new legislation. So there is a system of checks and balances which, which goes, goes wide far. They never decide in last instance. Only courts do so. Uh, but they nevertheless uh, play in a very active role in the triangle of regulation, administration, and, uh, and, and judiciary. Um, and on the, on, the, on the international level, then, the regulators group, in the jargon, the Article 29 group, is, is a clear example. Article 29 sets up this group of coordination of independent data protection authorities. Um, now... I could go into further details. I don't want to do this now. Um, but I just want to <coughs> highlight that when in the 90s, end of the 90s, this state of development was compared with US development. And uh, Howard Beals mentioned that after 20 years of uh, a lull, this is the word you used, um, there was a sudden activity. Um, we, it turned out to be possible to build a bridge, a transatlantic bridge, combining the European principles with the sort of bottom-up self-regulatory opting-in approach in the US uh, with backup of the Federal Trade Commission. And this led to the Safe Harbor Agreement, um, which uh, I think is interesting also because it led to a, 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 a development which I now see uh, growing into um, uh, much wider than what it originally was. But let me mention, uh, finally, some of the challenges. I see three, mainly. Um, and that includes also um, the appetite of public authorities to develop ever more uh, legislation with the uh, impact on data protection. But let me reduce this to three main points. And that is technological change. Undoubtedly, 
this is an area, information technology, with all its consequences, is, is becoming a pervasive factor in our societies. Um, the principles which were developed in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s, have shown remarkable resilience. And exactly because they were general principles, they've helped us to highlight how to deal with these new technologies. Um, I have, over the last year, issued a number of opinions on different examples of these developments, highlighting the consequence of the general principles and perhaps identifying some of the addition, additional measures we should take. But I'm quite, quite optimistic about that this is possible, whether it will be sufficient to face the challenges, that is something which tends to be seen. A second challenge is, no doubt, the preoccupation of our societies increasingly with problems of security. And this is not only public security. This is about avoiding of risks. We now analyze where we might possibly find problems, and we try to eliminate them as early as possible. And that is a, a legitimate but also a worrying concept. The distinction between privacy and data protection is profoundly relevant for this problem. Because under European thinking, you have to make sure that the government measures are legitimate and they have to be in line with the human rights, fundamental rights standards of Article 8, right to privacy, proportionality, legitimate purpose, and so forth. Clear legal basis. And on, in addition to that, the need to comply with data protection principles. And this is how we look at these measures. So if we look at the transatlantic dialogue, and it was referred to this morning in the, uh, in the introductory comments of uh, Vice President Frattini, I would be interested to see whether the principles coming out from the dialogue have sufficient substance, whether they have sufficient specificity, whether they have sufficient impact on the things they should cover in terms of exchange <coughs> of data to make our both societies secure, but also uh, in balance with the uh, principles of fundamental rights. And finally, the challenge of globalization. I note that this conference is about transatlantic privacy, but the real challenge is, of course, beyond transatlantic privacy. Because more and more we are living in a global world, and whatever is happening is happening globally. There we need, I would say, most of all, um, common views global standards, not necessarily approved by the United Nations, because that would be grand, but it's also a time-consuming process. I think that some of these, and most of these standards, are already available, because they have been developed over time, and we have to deliver practices which are in line with these standards. And then we have, as lawyers, to develop some solutions which are difficult, and they're called jurisdiction. But if we enhance the stakes and make the players, the big players, accountable for what they do under whatever we have, I think we'll have a great impact, and that's going to help us forward. Thank you. Okay, I think we have <coughs> 10 minutes for, for questions um, and answer. Who would like to put this the first question? I know it's always difficult. David, please. I'd like to ask the panelists um, maybe to compare and contrast it. Just as you talked about the independence required for the individual member state data protection authority, I think here in the United States we tend to think of our federal trade, U.S. Federal Trade Commission as an independent governmental authority, but I'm thinking that the words may mean different things in the context that we're using them. So I was wondering if the three of you could speak to yeah. compare and contrast the different kinds of independence. Uh, <clears throat> what independence means um, is um, uh, presently part of a court case um, which is being brought against Germany by the European Commission um, and it deals with the traditional position of authorities in a number of lenders which uh, are exercising their tasks as part of general administration. 
although they say in an independent manner. So the question there is, what is the institutional independence? What, what is it likely to be? Uh, that situation in Germany is rather exceptional. Um, and, um, um, but the decision of the outcome of the case is, is going to be uh, quite, quite indicative of what uh, an independent authority in Europe would mean. In a more general sense, uh, of course, we have to realize that even independent authorities, like courts, uh, need a nomination, need an appointment, um, and they need an administrative support. And so they need a budget, they need staff, and in an orderly society, these things are delivered by parliaments or governments, and, and somewhere th th there, is a, there is an appropriate balance. I've been um, told a few times that the executive privileges, the executive position, strong executive of the American president would not allow independent authorities. And I, I must say, from my uh, constitutional studies at law school and from experience after that, I think that was an overstated position and there are regulatory authorities which have developed. So. Um, I would think that positions like the FTC and the way they're composed might well, uh, might well go far in, 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 uh, in supporting a structure which, which, which I would welcome in the US. I see the complexities, but if, if, if the problem is, would it be possible to develop a US Privacy Protection Commission? I don't think so. And in the 70s and the 90s, there have been initiatives and those who took the initiatives apparently agreed with that. Um, but there is more. Um, I also see, and that's welcome, in, in the US a number of institutional safeguards developing, like impact assessments, uh, like publicity and, and comment, which are very similar to the ones we see in Europe. Um, and, and so I would say, keep going, do this. This is, this is part of the commonality, but that's, of course, uh, not yet uh, the full story of an, an independent independent authority. And international law and European law developing for transborder data flow, the test is not whether a third country does have a European style legislation. The test is, does it have adequate measures to cover the relevant fields and does it deliver compliance in a way we would expect, and that's the discussion we're having at, at, at present. Thank you. May I? Just, I agree with Peter, but I would like to make three comments. First of all, the idea of independence in Europe is mainly related with the government executive. If and in Italy, we have the, an extreme answer to this problem because the members of the authority are directly elected by the parliament in order to make evident <coughs> the independency <coughs> from the government. But there is a risk, the politicization of the authorities. This is a problem. But in any case, this is the line adopted. Second remark, when you look at the charter, the charter it will become legally binding at the end of this year, you can see that the only independent authority constitutionalized, if I, I can use this wording, is the Data Protection Authority. That's, that's very important because the direct, uh, this is the, the signal that in the developing of the European uh, system of law, there are also other independent authorities related with media, with antitrust, and so on. But for, the, for data protection, the charter make an explicit reference. And it is important to say that the only fundamental rights in, uh, nominated twice in the treaty 
and in the Charter is data protection. It gives a special status to data protection as in the field of the protection of fundamental rights. It's, it is important because it means that the level at where independent authorities are indicated is more important in front of others independent authorities that we can find everywhere in the system. The, just to, to, to describe the, the, the structural independence of, uh, of the Federal Trade Commission in particular and the independent agencies in general, um, uh, they're appointed for fixed terms. It's appointed by the President and confirmed by the, the Senate. Uh, at the uh, uh, at the FTC, there is uh, is one of the few Supreme Court cases on the issue of where a president tried to remove a commissioner and failed, um, uh, because uh, you can only remove a commissioner uh, for cause. Uh, the president appoints the chairman uh, from among the members, uh, but you know there's nothing that would guarantee a new president gets a vacancy. Um, uh, in the uh, in the in the structure of the of the arrangement, because they're seven year staggered terms, and eventually the president will get to appoint a new outside chairman, uh, but not necessarily right away. And and uh, actually, at the beginning of the Reagan administration, um, uh, it was close to a year before there was a vacancy uh, for the uh, for for Ronald Reagan to appoint a new uh, a new commissioner um, to the uh, to the to the commission. Uh, so there is structural independence. It is, uh, uh, you know, that it's that's what what often happens in practice is uh, people leave at the end of administration, uh, so that an incoming uh, uh, an incoming uh, uh, president does have the ability to appoint somebody new and can certainly name from among whoever's there can name a new chairman. Uh, uh, you know, but there is a there is a considerable amount of independence, uh, uh, and that you know that has been attention in in U.S. constitutional law, and that uh, various administrations have thought they should try to rein in um, uh, and assert more executive branch control over independent agencies, but so far it hasn't happened. Uh, um, we have question for, we have time for our last question? Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Howard, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, I'm Dave Bomber. I remember uh, you coming down for the conference at Carolina's Law School. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that, uh, on the one hand, Howard Beals is talking about the diminution in the significance of personal choice and notice as uh, protection of privacy, and the other two gentlemen are talking about uh, really uh, increased uh, protection uh, based on the European conception of privacy and data protection. Seems like uh, there's kind of a disconnect, and my question to the <coughs> European professors is uh, when you get on the internet and you go to buy a t-shirt and they ask you for your name, your uh, credit card information, etc., uh, what protections uh, does European law provide? Uh, I think in the United States, if they don't protect that uh, uh, customer data, as Howard said, that would be a, a, a deceptive trade practice and they could be prosecuted. So I'd be interested in your answer to that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> this uh, relates to my point that uh, the European legal approach in this area uh, is based on general scope and all relevant phases. So in, in very short, it will be a full service conference. Um, if the, of course, European law has its jurisdiction, but if I transplant your example in a European context, the company making the offer on the internet would be subject to all these principles, and it could only make the offer when it complies. Um, and, um, then the offer itself um, would be subject to notice, but that is not a necessary condition. Uh, it is a transparency principle. You have to give sufficient information no matter what. And then opting in is not the only legal base. It, it, we have a range of uh, legal requirements. And 
there is also, say, follow-up uh, principles on what happens after that. Um, the FTC typical approach is um, to uh, go after a company which is unfair or uh, fraud of this of, of misleading. The European approach uh, does not um, um, is is not based on on these conditions being fulfilled. So it's 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 uh, it is more inclusive. Um, now, the internet is a fascinating world. Things are getting very complicated and very dynamic. Um, but I can assure you that a, a, uh, a, 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 we have cases, uh, and quite a few, in which uh, these issues are covered. Um, but in principle, if a, a, a company doing this, or it could be government as well, huh? let's not forget, uh, e-government, e-health, e-commerce, whatever e, would be part of the uh, supervisory uh, tasks of the uh, Data Protection Authority, and uh, cases are being brought against companies. Um, I can give you the details, uh, but th that's the overall idea. Um, so it's a, a different approach. Um, it's, it's not left to consumers' choice only. It's also, uh, does uh, this company comply uh, in all its different relevant phases with the data protection principles. The, the place where there may be in some ways the biggest tension that, that grows out of that example is the kinds of things that, that e-commerce merchants are doing to protect themselves against the reality that there's a tremendous amount of credit card fraud that occurs uh, in online transactions. Um, uh, because a lot of those tools are information based. Uh, and they're based on information that was collected from different places and for different purposes. Uh, and they look for consistency between the information that is entered on this website in this transaction with the way that information has appeared in other transactions in, uh, in other circumstances. Uh, and they really do help to spot potentially fraudulent transactions. Uh, there was a cartoon in the early days of the internet that was that, that I've always liked that was a dog sitting at the computer typing saying the beauty of the internet is nobody knows you're a dog. Um, which, which is great unless you just sold a dog a big screen plasma TV. Um, you know, because, because you really do want to know something about who you are transacting with from the, from the merchant's perspective and information exchange is a big part of that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we break uh, for coffee. Yeah, we're, we're running a little bit behind, but it's you know, yes. a great uh, problem. We'll be coming back at 10.45, and so we're 15 minutes behind schedule. 10.45, uh, you'll be back in the room for our second panel. Thank you very much. Thanks.